I'm curious of, do you think the USB-C should be doing more or less of anything to navigate that brand and reputational aspects that it seems like they're facing right now? So completely separate of you as the PBA, just your strategic mind. Do you yeah. feel like it's just unfair? It's unwarranted, and that, and we can yeah, skip. You know, I, I think you know if I ha you know, you, and you're kind of you know making me sort of say you know, what what area should they do, be better at or fix or you something. You could say it's unwarranted. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another tour talk. I can't thank all of you guys enough for your support uh, of this style of show. We got Tom Clark today. I. I just sent the email and kept my fingers crossed and he was awesome and responded. So I can't thank him enough for that. But uh, my goal today is to really get his unique perspective on the state of bowling, what we need to do to grow it further. But first, just in case those of you that don't know him, he, he bowled in college. So he does have a bowling background and he really started in journalism because he was passionate about the media coverage that the bowling was getting. And uh, which landed him as the chief marketing officer at USBC. Is that correct? Yeah, that's that's good. That's, that's good. I was trying to do my research, and I was like, "Wow!" And so, of course, we'll we'll see what he thinks of USBC when he was there versus now, and if there's any changes, good or bad. And uh, of course, you've also played a huge role in some of the massive changes at the PBA, like the World Series of Bowling, adding that, the PBA League, all of the streaming. Um, you know, you've had different streaming partners. The transition from ESPN to Fox, um, and you've had you worked under multiple owners, so you've had multiple owners basically say that you're the right guy for the job, uh, which includes Bolero uh, or Bullmore as an owner. So we'll get your idea on them as a company, which is always a controversial topic. But first, I just want to thank you so much uh, for making time. Bowling is really incredible in that we have this small channel with four thousand subscribers. And I get guys like Tom Clark. They're like, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll do your show. It's just incredible. So I can't thank you enough. And how are, how are you doing this morning? Great, great. No, I appreciate the interest. Uh, and uh, I had an opportunity to catch a couple of your uh, shows and, um, you know, the intelligent uh, questioning and the intelligent conversation um, can only can only help the game. And uh, I'm for anything that helps the game. And so I really appreciate your interest and then your initiative to uh to try to have these kinds of conversations and pu and uh, publish them or broadcast them in, in any in any way or form and uh, so uh, thanks to you for getting it started and uh, reaching out. Thanks, yeah, thanks so much for that, man. And it's funny when I do talk to different people. Some people are like want to kind of avoid the more sensitive, uh, touchy conversations, um, and then some people like yourself are, you know, ready to really uh, talk about it and and entertain other people's perspectives and. I can only imagine that has played a huge role in why you've been so successful at the PBA is that you, you seem to be really open to other ideas and, and brainstorming and talking about it, which I love. So um, I want to start off with kind of the PBA and its story, but I also want to make sure we help people understand what it exactly is that you do. What does the PBA commissioner do and how does it differ from like the term and director or the owner or the equipment and specs? Like help us get an idea of the the cog that is Tom Clark and the PBA. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're kind of uh, first and foremost, you're really the the glue guy for every department and every single thing that happens um, within the PBA. And, and so, you, you know, you start with the, the key pillars of the PBA and dealing with the players and the game and the fans and the media partnerships and the sponsorship partnerships, um, the membership, um, and so all of these things are the key elements and, you know, ultimately to, to most of the public, um, I'm responsible for every, every aspect of it. And I feel that way, um, through the years, as you mentioned, you know, changes with different ownerships and different help at different times and investments at different times. Um, it's changed for me, like what I'm, you know, completely, you know, in charge of or, um, you know, responsible for to down to the lowest possible denominator level. Um, and so that's changed. And uh, luckily, fortunately, you know, been been relieved of, of having to be, you know, in charge of every single aspect of the PBA. Right. Um, previously, we had, you know, um, a staff that was really that I was really proud to have even joined and and they had so much um, uh, 
institutional knowledge of uh, of the PBA and love for it and connection to it that was really more about joining with them than moving that them in different directions to try to uh, maintain the PBA and 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 put us in better position to grow. And then you know, with a, with a new ownership, you know, being able to let go of some of the areas that like a sales or licensing or um, um, some other different specific areas, um, even even the overall media uh, production and the media um, side of things, uh, to be able to focus more on the game, the membership. Um, the all levels of the PBA from the regionals to the senior PBA 50 to the national tour and um, the scheduling and the rules and the formats and working with the player committee right. um, and just trying to create a whole better PBA. So, and then facing the fans is really the thing that, um, that I really take a lot of pride in and, and, sure. and understand that they are, you know, the key to our growth. And so, trying to make sure we, we, we communicate with them and, and I have as close of a relationship with them so I can figure out what they want um, uh, is, is a big part of that as well. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So you mentioned that it sounds like you used to be responsible for a much wider gamut of things and that that has kind of narrowed. Is that kind of what I was getting from that? Well, yeah, I still feel like I'm responsible for it, but now we have people that are, ultimately responsible on every level uh, like a, me a vice president of media for bolero or um, bolero's uh, sales department being able to utilize the resources within the company both with people or even it um, you know and being able to uh, rely on the, the company's backbone you know to um, and, and then ultimately even decision making and budgeting on a lot of those areas that uh, is really time consuming. So I hope to see an improvement in, in uh, the product, you know, based on um, which, which to me is the players and the events and the game and the, the sport itself, right. um, having a little more time to concentrate on that hopefully helps all of their efforts in sales and licensing right. and production and media. So yeah, it, but it has uh, it has evolved a, a lot over the years. I've been here, I, you know, I've been with the PBA since two thousand eight. You know, so it's been fifteen years. You know, when you're yeah. when you're sitting there and at, at the World Series of Bowling and uh, a kid named Dio Bernard wins a title, <laughs> and and he he realized that you were in that same building and started the World Series when this young man was four years old, you know, yeah. you realize you've kind of been around, you know? So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's, and that was why I wanted to touch on that in the intro is because the idea of, you know, you've, you've had multiple owners and the fact that they've all kept you in the position and been supportive, I think is a huge testament uh, to you. So speaking of that, it's, so then it sounds like maybe when Bolero took over, um, it, it maybe changed how you could impact and influence and operate the PBA. Is that fair to say? How, how has your role changed as ownership has changed? Well, at first there was, there was a lot of education and, and teaching the, the people involved about the history of the PBA, what's worked, what hasn't worked, the right contacts, uh, creating um, a, a seamless transition to new um, voices and new people that are current partners were talking to and uh, from the from the biggest partners like Fox, you know, down to every product registered company to even the membership. And right. so working with uh, this new group of people uh, from Bolero, you know, was, you know, that was a big part of my role. And that takes a while. I mean, you know, you, you shouldn't be ex expecting people to come in as experts. And, and I felt really comfortable in, in trying to share as much knowledge as possible um does that answer your question or yeah, you yeah. Get the question? <laughs> yeah. yeah kind of yeah i just didn't know if if you know the guys at microsoft so viewers if you don't know there was previous owners that um i think were used to work at microsoft or were large shareholders of microsoft or something like that and then uh and then recently bullmore and i just didn't know if there were two very different perspectives from those types of owners you know one kind of coming from bowling one coming from tech and if that, if there was any stark contrast between those two, that impacted your ability to really like lead the company or lead, you know lead the brand. What's up, guys? Just a quick message to say that if you like bowling videos like this, make sure to hit that subscribe button. 
As always, we appreciate the support so much. We're growing quickly and we can't thank you enough. Now let's get back to the interview. Well, oh, they're completely different. I mean, it's it's completely different. And, you know, for over a year or maybe even two years, one big part of my job working for the previous ownership was managing the sale of the PBA mm. uh, and first going out and talking to prospective buyers. And that was a big job. And then because wow. the, because our previous owners who had invested a lot of money, a lot of time, spent a lot of years on it, loved it. They're all in the Hall of Fame now. Uh, but they were, you know, pretty much they were pretty much ready to see how the PBA could get to another level with a different type of ownership. And, and so finding and, 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 and ending up with the largest, you know, uh, chain of bowling centers in the country with this incredible ambition and, and going public uh, within a corporate, you know, structure and the different ways that a, a bowling center chain could uh, utilize the PBA, use the PBA, um, work within yeah. the work within its you know so that's completely different from three guys that thought it would be really cool to buy the pba and you know have this media yeah. entity in sport um yeah. and so and i loved working with our previous owners and they were they gave me a, a lot of leeway they just they just gave me the uh the basic uh the basic rule was you know make money you know don't lose any money you know? yeah exactly yeah. it's like do the, everything you can but don't but, but you know we're we're at some point they were kind of through with the with the investment stage and that's really when I took over of, as right. the CEO I took over as the commissioner in 2011 but uh the uh, CEO of the company from 2013 to the end of 2019 when Bolero closed the uh, the deal so you know, going from the commissioner and kind of having other another CEO back in the in the older PBA, old PBA, which was the new PBA when I was there, um, uh, you know, was a big change and a pretty uh, educational uh, situation for me. I mean, I hadn't been involved with uh, dealing completely with the, the ownership and giving reports and um, working on the legal side of things and on the accounting side of things. Most of my focus was on the product and the media and then becoming the CEO, being involved with all aspects of the business, right. uh, you know, became a little overwhelming and we had a, a, a limited budget and we were doing well. And we finally had, you know, we worked towards a, uh, a situation where, we could go out and sell to a new media partner and and we moved from espn to fox and it's all pre bolero you know mm -hmm. with the previous ownership and that was a major business achievement a major shift yeah. in sea change and potential in the pba and uh leading us through that was really the accomplishment of of my career in, in terms yeah. of i felt like okay we got a chance we did it we did. Yeah. We got yeah. a chance and we can build on on this. And um, but then uh, being able to go back and concentrate more on the game, the scheduling, particularly after COVID knocked us sideways and you had to figure out how to get yeah. through all that. Right. Um, it was relieving to have a, a, a backbone corporation like Bolero behind uh, the. Yeah. PBA. yeah. And just to also kind of inform viewers um, and please tell me if this is incorrect. One of the advantages with Bolero owning it is that there's a lot of natural advertising and marketing of Bolero that they can do through the PBA that creates a natural value for them that maybe the owners at Microsoft or previous owners couldn't really generate that same type of value. Um, is that is that fair to say? So that there's yeah, kind absolutely. of yeah when you're yeah. the when you're the owner and the product of the of bowling and uh, people going bowling in any facet um, can benefit from your exposure and your wide exposure on broadcast television and cable television and other media touch points, social media, and YouTube and all those things. Um, you know, that becomes a great investment by that company to right. say, you know, we right. get involved with the sport of bowling. They, they understand it. It, it helps. Uh, it helps them with a certain faction of the bowling industry. Right. You know, besides the entertainment or recreational side, the competitive bowler side and the fan side. Um, and then to be able to uh, 
you know, I always have thought the PBA was the best marketing for any form of bowling. I mean, we're on television, people catch it, we're on major yeah. networks, and you just get the idea in your head. I don't, why don't we even, why haven't we gone bowling in a while? So we've always been a great promoter of the game. And, right, and, right. and so to then have, have it be where they can be specific to uh, a certain chain of bowling centers, that makes it even, even better. And, and of course, there, there's never been any idea that well, don't help people go bowling anywhere else. We try to help people go. But bo- one of our biggest sponsors is go bowling, which means yeah. go bowling anywhere. And yep, yep. Um, so so it's uh, yeah, I, I think that they see both sides and see the value yep. uh, in a couple different sides and the potential um, can always uh, can always lead us to even and, and their company to even greater things. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to make sure, you know, with viewers that we take the opportunity sometimes to help understand some of the positives that they might be fearful of. And I know there was some, a lot of fear when Bullmore purchased uh, the PBA, but I just want to make sure that those viewers understand that, you know, the Bullmore can get a lot of exposure from the PBA. Uh, that is a huge value to them before they are e- before even a dollar of profit. There, there's this a tremendous amount of value uh, to them before they even profit a dollar that maybe other owners, might not get and so then profit is even even more of a focus you know um if that's if that's fair to say um so from those you 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 spoke about the fox deal um so from that to the world series to the pba league you had some pretty big accomplishments under your tenure which one i'll let you get up to maybe two uh do you think is the biggest impact on the pba in terms of whatever metrics you use, whether that's TV viewership, whether that's brand and reputation, what one or two big accomplishments under your tenure do you think have had the biggest impact on the PBA and why? Why do you think that? Why do you think that? Well, I I think those first two, the the first two that you just mentioned, I mean, you can't really take them off the first paragraph and they both in the World Series, uh, the start of it, and then uh, and then moving to Fox. I mean, both of those things were you know, pretty gigantic. And also um, I came into them from completely different perspectives. So the World Series was one of the first things that I did with the PBA. And it was because of the current situation, both financially and in the sport of bowling and and the types of players that were um, becoming some of the greatest in the world and maybe weren't on the PBA tour. That bothered me. That was one of my first goals to make sure we had the greatest players in the world. Um, and then, and then to see how the finances were, were being hit by, a, actually a, a recession in, in 2008. And then to be able to, you know, create, a, a, a new, uh, way to produce, um, professional bowling that would also bring in the greatest players from all over the world, um, you know, was, uh, was really a, a, a sea change moment for the PBA that was instigated by us uh, to say, let's start this new thing, the world series. Then with, with Fox, it was more like, okay, we have a five-year deal with ESPN. We, uh, by the time, and, and this was back in 2013, uh, in 2013, when, when you know ESPN was part of the whole World Series growth, and I love ESPN by the way, and yeah, it was yeah. a great partnership, but it was limiting. And if we were going to try to take the PBA to another level, we wanted to be on broadcast television. You know, we wanted rights fees as opposed to a revenue share type situation with a broadcast partner, um, and we really wanted to have help with sales because at, at ESPN. When we are selling to prospective sponsors, um, you know, we're essentially we're selling against our own broadcast partner because ESPN was out selling their own programming. And we were just part of the we were on ESPN and had the right to sell a percentage of commercial units and signage right. and things like that to all, to other sponsors. But now you're going out and talking to people that already talked to ESPN about being involved with another sport or another flight yeah. of commercials. And so I think that that, became, that was a little difficult for us to yeah. get to another level. And so, you know, did it when, feel like they were almost a, a competitor in a sense in that well, way? It, yeah, I mean, it, they it's weren't. Hard. In, yeah, in it's hard sense. to use that word, but yeah. yeah, in a sense, you're right, absolutely. Yeah. And and uh, and many other niche sports have dealt with the same thing. I mean, it's been documented. It's the type of thing that people talk talk about when they talk about ESPN and um, and how they 
um, where they invest the most of their money and then how they have other programming. And it, it's pretty interesting. But but we knew we had to find a broadcast partner that wanted us, that wanted to find value in us, that wanted to pay for for us and wanted to be able to sell against us. And that's how we would actually grow. But that was risky. I mean, and we had been on ESPN since 1979 sure, and, sure. Had, you know, and had been our only partner since 19 since 2000 was ESPN for the most part yeah, sure. one offs with CBS and thing. But yeah. um, but so th that was a, a major risk to go out and try to sell. But we worked from 2013 to 18 to develop stars, uh, continue with strong ratings, despite a reduction in the amount of events and a reliance on the World Series of Bowling from a efficiency efficiency standpoint uh, right, right. Uh, financially. And, and so we were able to do all those things and have a successful product to go out and sell. And then we talked to everybody and to find uh, Fox and land there uh, was a, um, you know, was a huge uh, victory and, and gave the whole yeah. PBA an entirely new life, you know, and then, you know, a year later, you know, we, we sell to, after we start, we did the first year on Fox in 2019 before Bolero, At the end of 2019 Bolero bought the PBA. So now, those dynamics shifted again a little bit, but yeah, uh, but it, it, you know, but those two things, I mean, world series kind of, I, I would, if I had to really, you know, you know, speak about both, I, I think that the world series of bowling essentially saved the PBA. I mean, it really yeah. did yeah. when, when I look back and see what we did and accomplished and, and then Fox, you know, helped us take things to another level yeah. where, yeah. We're on broadcast television 16, 18 hours uh, a year now. And um, for 20 years, uh, since the PBA was essentially canceled on ABC in 1997, we hadn't been on broadcast right. television yeah. once, twice in 20, 20 years. And so yeah. to be able to be where we are now because of that Fox relationship, uh, I'm really proud of those two things. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really cool. I, I totally agree. And even I remember the first live telecast I watched on Fox because I didn't watch uh, the telecast that much on TV for a while because I kind of knew the results most of the time. Mm -hmm. They were previously recorded before. My wife's not a bowler at all. She averages 100. And I remember the first time I was watching a live telecast on Fox and I kind of woke up and I was kind of excited to watch. And she's like, I haven't seen you excited to watch bowling in a while like this. And then I turned on. She's like, bowling's on Fox now? You know, and she, and she has not she has no idea about any of it. And she, she was just able to kind of tell the difference. So it's it's kind of it's kind of cool. Relative to Fox, though, um, going into it, I'm sure they had some expectations. You had expectations around ratings. How how is the PBA doing with Fox, and and relative to both of your expectations? Uh, I think uh, very well. I mean, the numbers have gone up pretty much every year. I mean, yeah, you know, the COVID years were kind of weird. I mean, you had to deal with some some unusual circumstances. That was a couple of years, 2020, 2021 knocked us off our stride a little bit. And yet we still did really well. And we showed how flexible we were as a sport. And we were able to provide live uh, content, you know, really creatively uh, and, and rearrange our schedules. But, but I mean, it, it created, it also created odd year over year comparisons when it comes to ratings and things. But, but generally speaking, because of the broadcast exposure on Big Fox, because of the re-airs that uh, Fox provides, uh, because of the uh, greater promotion that Fox gives us, um, the numbers from the last couple of years of ESPN, which is the leader in sports programming, you know, uh, yep. but but comparatively, our right. numbers are better now than they yep. than they were. We're reaching more people. We're reaching them more regularly. We're reaching them with more live, like just like you. I'm the same way. I want to watch live. I mean, that's yeah. that's what that's what makes sports fun, and yeah. and so we're able to do all of those different things. Um, with Fox that uh, make it a make it a big win, and I, and Fox has re-signed twice now with us. Since That's great. The first deal, yeah. um, and we're signed through 2025. And and uh, all my conversations with the executives that I first was dealing with only myself in in Los Angeles, all of them are still just in love with the PBA. They still That's send great. votes, and it's a great show. You know, our friend Rob Stone. I mean, um, he he's. Uh, you know, become one of the great and uh, one of the top flight announcers, certainly at Fox, but in all sports broadcasting. Yeah. And he was our guy when he when he was breaking into the business, you know, back on ESPN and 
And yeah, he took yeah. the bowling job because it was the only thing he could get. You know, and he's, <laughs> now he picks and chooses. I mean, he's yeah. he's number one guy in soccer and the number one guy in college football and college yeah. basketball. Yeah. And now he chooses and he still wants to be with with the PBA whenever yeah. he can. And yeah. uh, and he becomes a great connective tissue. So it's um, uh, I've, I've really been happy with. Uh, That's with great. The Rob, Rob is, a, is a great segue into another question, which is the is the announcers you know the people calling the action um obviously i only take things and whining and complaining you see on social media with a grain of salt but how much do you think randy or rob or those types of complaints you might see from time to time how much do you think they impact ratings and and do, how do you think about managing that aspect of who's calling the action on the show or is that completely up to fox uh, well, it was usually it, it had been all, all up to me. I've been in, completely involved with those processes, but now Fox is definitely uh, the main driver on uh, the play-by-play -play announcer for sure, and it's part of the the deal that they handle that. And we're still, you know, we still have a lot of input and um, and are involved with you know wanting to to continue with Randy as being that that con constant voice. Now he's he's broadcast more PBA than anyone ever, and he's even passed Bo in the number of years. You yeah. know, that he's been on. Um, but uh, I, I definitely don't think that the online chatter has any impact on ratings. I mean, I think that it can only help, even if it's negative, it, it helps. I mean, pick pick your favorite announcer, and, and I will search him on Twitter, and it will say he's the worst announcer ever. <laughs> Al Michaels. I mean, uh, you yeah. Know, you name the greatest, and they're just getting killed every day. And somebody <laughs> like Rob Stone. I mean, he gets killed more by soccer than he does even by bowling, and and yeah. he's the best, and you know, in yeah, soccer. exactly. So, and yeah. he has so much experience that he teaches uh, the rest of us how to take what you read online with a grain of salt, and yeah. uh, and how to emotionally handle it. Because that's one thing I've lived through that is underrated. I think is when you think that my first year with the PBA was two thousand eight. I mean, that's essentially when social media like began. I mean, that yeah. was Facebook. And so I've been there for this whole run of people thinking what they're saying is right and they are allowed <laughs> to say it and they're allowed to sit behind a computer and say it. And, and so I've gone through a lot with that where you go, oh, yeah. this bothers me. I know this doesn't bother me. I'm now, oh, wait, I hope they keep talking about me too. You know, hey, could you say one thing nice about me? You know, the, you, know yeah. you live through all of that. And yeah. uh, but you learn that um, you know it, it doesn't have really that much impact, and you let the you let the, the yeah. stuff that it's just crazy or just wants to be someone wants to sound like they're they're smart, and and you just let that fall off, and, yeah. and keep, yeah. you know keep your eye on the job and, and keep your eye on doing a, a good job. No one has ever criticized me and been right more than myself. Right. Know, so I know every single thing that I wish was better. And so when I hear other, the only time any criticism bothers me is when they're right. <laughs> you know? right. Yeah. But I already know that I already know it. So I don't need to hear it from them, but yeah, you know, that's the only time it even kind of bothers me. So <laughs> yeah, no, I, I absolutely. And I think the dangerous thing for viewers, especially same thing for me. I mean, I, I graduated high school in 06 on 36 so I still had a, a good amount of life where there was no social media and then I got to experience, you know, my space. And, and I think for me, that experience has allowed me to understand that like, that isn't necessarily reality or truth. You know, it's, it's really a, a small subsect and it's not until you really get out of that and you converse with a lot of bowlers and you really kind of get involved with the community that you get a more accurate picture of how do people perceive Bolero? How do people perceive USBC? How do people perceive Tom Clark or the PBA or Randy Peterson? And it's almost the reality is almost always far more positive than what you see on social media, you know? And so, uh, but uh, so get, getting back to my main line of questioning here, I guess, um, what do you think holds the PBA back? So you just mentioned kind of being able to be critical of yourself. What do you think holds the PBA back? from being more mainstream like the nfl nba you know pga what do you think is is holding us back from getting there well, it's nothing new it, it's the same old stuff that really plagued has plagued the game for a long time perceptions uh respect um i think that uh it's always puzzled me as a fan of all sports and played most sports and um and I've always had so much respect for 
bowling and and the 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 skills and the uh, dedication it takes and the um, and talent um, and strategic mind that it takes to be great at it and from a fan standpoint the excitement level that it provides and how fun it is to watch and so it's always you know when I sit there at the tournament of champions this you know two weeks ago and watch that final match the first thing I say and the first text I send out to whoever I was talking to at the time was I just when I watch a match like that, I don't understand why bowling isn't more popular. I mean, like, how you know, we have a great audience. There were 750,000 people watching that. That's fantastic. That's great. But why isn't it four million? You know, and why wouldn't anyone given the opportunity you know, to watch that not come away with it saying, when's the next one? Because it's just really thrilling to me. So. We, uh, we continue to try to reach the fan in better ways um, and educate them in better ways without bogging things down and making it boring or anything like that. So it's it's been that same fine line. But why, you know, it, and you mentioned those other sports, you know, think about, you know, I hate to, it, it's like, think about high school. It's kind of like high school. So who gets the attention in high school? The best, the quarterback of the football team? or the, the anchor bowler on the bowling team. <laughs> right. I mean, now why, you know, is it, you know, is it because there's more violence in football? It's, it's perceived as more athletic. Is it because the NFL has um, the Super Bowl has become a national holiday and something that, uh, the, the, that has been cultivated through a culture and the fan support in all these cities, you look at all the sports and you say, well, why, but it kind of comes back to that baseline of, well, Right. You know, a, a kind of culture and perception. The kid, yeah, and and um, and that's just kind of the way it is, and that's one reason why uh, you know you mentioned some accomplishments. And I was thinking that you know actually the first event that I did for the PBA was the Chris Paul Celebrity Invitational because I had some I had that some great one contacts yeah. with Chris Paul and his agents, and our first event was LeBron James was on it, and you know I'm yeah. sitting there and he walks in and I'm like, see, I told you this was going to be good, you know? yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it was, and. Uh, and that lasted for 10, you know, it's still, we still have a relationship with some of those guys and Mookie Betts. And that's why, that's why I sometimes people criticize for us gravitating to them. But I like to let other people see that Chris Paul thinks bowling's cool. I mean, yeah. Paul respects professional bowlers. Mookie Betts respects professional bowlers. He hits them up all day long for information and how to get better, how to drill a ball, which ball should he get? I mean, yeah. and he's w- w- probably the top line athlete in the world right now, the way he plays, uh, you know, for the Dodgers. I mean, and yeah. so and, and so that's why I kind of gravitate to that stuff. It, it's just because I crave for bowling to have the kind of respect that I think it yes. deserves. And when I see people that other people respect, respect it, I want to illuminate that, you know. Yeah. So, But it really comes down to those things. Then I think when you drill down a little bit further and you look at our ratings and say, okay, so then – why wouldn't another network pay more for the right to show bowling on TV? And that's the key to a professional sport, having a strong media rights deal. Uh, the, the worst part of our numbers, as opposed to the, the growth and the, and the total number of people watching, is the demographics that mm-hmm. kind of illustrate an older crowd. And there's old, mostly older crowd watching almost any sports on TV now, but but ours is particularly high. You know, a lot of our fans are people that have been fans for decades, which we love. And I love seeing them at every event. But we've got to bring on more uh, younger um, fans. And, and so uh, that's where I think people like you come into play and YouTube and the Brad and Kyle and Packy and Darren Tang and Belmo and all the guys that have started these YouTube channels that are reaching a younger demographic, pulling them in, getting them to know the players and now tuning into the PBA. Um, so, you know, I think that would be an area where you, you really, you want to see our numbers improve in the 18 to 49 year olds. Uh, and, and so, yeah. um, so you know, if you're looking for those areas as to why, why aren't we on those other, on this other level, you know? Yeah. Okay. That's great. So to kind of try to recap that a little bit for the viewers, because I think, you know, how do we get the PBA to become the NFL, some type of almost, what feels like unrealistic, you know, goal or dream, I, th- I think is a qu- question that many viewers would have because, like them and like you and I, we want we we love bowling and we know it deserves the respect. 
So it sounds like your your main answers are the first one is the culture and perception, which maybe it sounds like the PBA can't single handedly do that. To your point, content creators, you know, help with that. And this is a common debate that I have with people within bowling of, you know, is Brad and Kyle or the house or those kinds of things or is social media content good for bowling? And to your point, this is how I feel. It's extremely good for bowling because it's a way to kind of start to create that relationship with that younger demographic that you were saying. So trying to get that younger demographic is a huge way of getting there. And now in terms of the perception and culture of it, do you think it's just that people are able to see in these other sports, bigger, stronger, faster people? Like, is it, is it seeing the athleticism and the uniqueness is just much easier to see because it's not as of a cerebral of a game or a strategic of a game in that particular way? I mean, what do you, you have any ideas? You have well, a that's an element of it, and it, and again, uh, you take it all the way back to high school. That's an element of it, and you know the the, the gladiator type of a uh, culture of some sports, or the danger involved, and the chance of getting hit, you know, or having to be, you know, um, a perfect athletic specimen, and having that be something people like to. To look at i mean but there's always other examples of other sports or other success stories that aren't necessarily reliant on that it's kind of just bowling because so many people have actually played it and everyone pretty pretty much has bowled and such a large percentage of those people when they did bowl it was just for fun and it was to uh. use a ball that was there and it was you know to rent shoes and just laugh and have a few beers or laugh right. and soda and a pizza and, and have a birthday party and have birthday cake and it's everywhere. And, and so the, the first impression, you know, of the sport is more recreation, game, video game, yeah. recreation, yeah. Um, you know, uh, fun house like stuff, as opposed to being introduced to it completely by the athletic side of it and the sport mm -hmm. side of it. I think we're, we're almost so fun. Yeah. And so much of it in entertainment that it overwhelms the chance to get people to look at it from, a, from an athletic standpoint. I mean, that's, that's yeah, I, I, I think that's a great point. I've, I've never heard that said before, and I, I think that's a great point. You know, so, but I will, I'll point out that, you know, and I said that for a while, and I was trying, you know, because I, I was trying to, trying to get our industry to introduce the game to people uh, from a sports standpoint early. And then, you know, I remember we had a rookie of the year in like 2000, um, like uh, 2019 or so. And um, and it was Cameron Doyle. And this kid had come up in bowling. He was he like he he won a regional when he was a teenager. He made yeah, the finals yeah. at the U.S. Open when he was 14. He was a can't miss can't miss kid. And Incredible. I remember asking yeah. him, how'd you get introduced into bowling? He went to a birthday party. You know, so he blew my theory completely up. So right. the, you know, there's plenty of people that actually the first impression was a birthday party. And yet it still stuck with them as, wait sure. a minute, I want to get good at this game and treat it as a sport and play it in college and things like that. You know, so um, but it's funny uh, you mentioned like bigger, stronger, faster. But I actually spoke to um, the Indiana uh, bowling proprietors uh, a few days ago. Um, at their 75th anniversary of bowling in Indiana. And the, and the event was held at this beautiful hotel in French Lick, Indiana. And to me, as a sports fan, French Lick is famous for one thing, and that's Larry Bird, one of the great basketball, you know, one of the greatest basketball players ever, yeah. and uh, a legend. And, and, you know, and as soon as I got to French Lick, I had never been there before, I went and saw Larry Bird's childhood home. I went and saw a statue. Uh, of Larry Bird at the rec center. I saw the street sign, Larry Bird Boulevard. Right. And so I was speaking to the to the group in Indiana, and I said, you know, as great as Larry Bird was, I don't think there would be a statue for him and a street sign named after him and that everyone would still remember everything he's done if he wasn't six foot nine. <laughs> and being, and being six foot nine He's one of 0.0003% or something of the population. Yeah. There's only 1% of the population in America that's over 6'4". Yeah. So, so, so what I was trying to get across with that was, you know, it's great that people in French Lick could look at Larry Bird as an inspiration, that they could make it big. But guess what? 
They're not going to because they're not going to go to be six nine. Yeah. But they could get a college education through bowling. Bowlers can be any size, shape, uh, any background. They could be short. They can be tall. They can be wide. They can be strong. They can be thin. Um, you know, and they can be any kind of shape. So this is open to everyone to be a part of our game. It can be, a, it's a lifetime sport. They can travel, they can compete, they can win money, even as, as kids, and they can win money towards college educations. Uh-oh. You still there? Did I lose you? Or did you lose me? Um, hmm. Let's see if you come back. Tom, are you there? Let's see here. Not sure what... Not sure what happened there. Did you lose signal or did I? Sorry. No. It's okay. Did you lose um, internet or did I? I know what happened. No, yeah, I know. I can see what happened. I was plugged in. I was plugged in and... Uh, Hold on. No, no worries, man. No worries. Hold on one second. Hold on one second. Because I, I what I have to do is get this uh back up. My phone my phone ran out when I was uh connected to it. Oh um, no, no, no sweat, man. I, I don't have anything in the next couple hours, so I'm going to run and go grab a water. I'll be right back. I think I think I got it. Um, okay, great, great. Who was it? I was with Larry Bird. Yeah, it's, no, <laughs> so you, you were. Got, I think I was just saying that bowling's even better, right? Yeah, you were talking. You were you were going on a great a, a, a great rant, which I can totally relate to. I felt like I've I've done it before in the pro shop, of you know being able to earn scholarships and just kind of how deep and wide and relatable and accessible bowling is. Um, yeah. And that's, all, that's what I was, and that's the point I was trying to get across. Yeah. Is that, you know, bowling is better for other, for kids to get involved with than almost any other sport. You know, the injuries aren't as prevalent. The uh, chance that you can only play for a few years and you can't play later in your life. Uh, the, the chances at actually having fun playing the sport and earning towards college, you know, so, you know, we all look up to these idols like the Larry Birds of the world, and they've got the, the statues built and inspire and inspire a lot of people. But I really think we could do a better job with utilizing professional bowlers. And where's those statues? Yeah. And you know, like I like when I was in Indiana, and the person that's sitting in front of me is Mike Albee. You know, my point is, hey, let, let, let's build a let's build a statue to Mike Albee. You know, and a lot maybe a lot of kids will have that inspiration to yeah, yeah. be that great and, and accomplish and, and play sports their whole life like him. Yeah. And I guess that, that leads me to another question. Please push back if you think this is a, a bad one or you disagree. But does that would you say then that, you know, for is it I don't want to ask this. 
watching something on TV a lot of the times is something you don't want to, you can't relate to. It's almost like X games or, you know, it's, it's, you, you want to see something that like, Oh my gosh, I, you know, I can never see this. And it's almost unrelatable. Right. Um, so would it be fair to say that the aspect that many bowlers love about bowling that I love about bowling, the fact that it is so accessible and so relatable and so doable by anyone, do you think that that serves as a disadvantage to being kind of really idolized and lifted up in a way that an NFL or, you know, to your point that these, these bigger guys, you know, so is it, is, is our blessing kind of our curse when it comes to becoming massive in a media sense and like a TV sense? Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of what I was alluding to uh, with the idea that most people are introduced to the game purely as a fun thing to do. And that most people yeah. play, and we talk about 70 million people a year bowl, but you know, it's 1 million or 2 million a year bowl regularly and maybe 20 million bowl once every couple months or something like that. But those, the vast majority of people that are coming into a bowling center and having a, a great time is the takeaway they have from it. And so it does make it too attainable too uh, like, you can't just go play baseball at Yankee stadium, you know, but you can open bowl at Riviera lanes today, you know, in Ohio, yeah. and I would request lanes 27 and eight and the general manager there might have no idea why, you know, but I want to bowl on that pair. That's where the yeah. history of bowling took place. And that would be fun. And uh, that you would think that would be an advantage to bowling. But yes, I think the familiarity, the idea that anyone can do it, while it's true and really shows that because with so many people being able to do it, the ones on top actually have to be that much better even. Yes. Because yes. About, and throughout the rest of sports, there it's incredibly difficult to get to the top, but you're not even in it. You know, you're not even right. in it to, to begin with. So I think those things, yeah, from a perception, back to what I was talking about. Yeah, those totally. perceptions are impacted by that familiarity. And, yeah. you know, it, it does – it is true that most people want to watch things that they can't do, want to be amazed, you know. Yeah. And um, and so you search for those things in bowling. It's not like we haven't all seen a 300 game or a 7-10 split made or, you know. And so you're, you're searching and you're building the history and the significance and – the life changing yeah. elements of the sport in order to get people to buy into, I need to watch this, you know? And yeah. Yeah. But I, I mean, I, I, I like that though, because in my opinion, sometimes you hear uh, feedback around bowling or the PBA where it's just like, well, you know, you don't get your kids into it, which is something you mentioned because you know, they don't make enough or, you know, but don't, people don't necessarily always talk about the trade off that comes with some of the aspects that the PBA might or bowling might struggle with in terms of trying to become a mainstream sport. It's just, Oh, well, it's not mainstream. And then the conversation stops there as opposed to really maybe the trade off to that is this incredibly positive thing that as bowlers, we should be more proud of is the fact that our sport is so accessible. Anyone can do it and get good at it. You can do it for decades, you know, and then the area for me that I am most passionate about that I feel like really differentiates bowling is the social and communal aspect because I played a lot of football and basketball and because you're introduced to it from a very competitive place from the very beginning, you're not really there to make friends. You know, you're not going to, you know, that, that kind of scenario where I've seen people meet their spouses in bowling, meet their best mm -hmm. friends and, and have lifelong friendships because, you know, at league it's a, you know, it's a five man team. You're spending more time socializing than you are bowling, you know, and, and, uh, and I've always loved that about bowling. So, Anyways, uh, obviously you and I could probably but, go and don't forget. I mean, and yet, but and when when you almost you know say okay, well we you can't make as much. All right, let, let's talk about that for a second. So sure. this, this this year, you know, five different people won a hundred thousand dollars winning a bowling tournament on broadcast national television, yeah. which opens up other doors for you. Um, yeah. So we do have a professional sport and it's been active since yeah. 1958 and on television consistently for, you know, over 60 years. Um, and there's a lot of sports that sometimes you hear bowlers be jealous of Olympic sports, <laughs> list the Olympic sports, list every single one of them. And how yeah. many of those Olympic sports are on Fox every week with, exactly. uh, with a, with a championship for a hundred thousand. I mean, the race walking, Olympic gold medalist 
there isn't race walking on Fox every week. You know, there right. isn't shot put. You know, there isn't uh, um, even the big ones, swimming. You think swimming doesn't look at bowling and say, why don't we have a pro swimming tour? Why isn't it on every week? Yeah. The big <laughs> race and the winner gets this. I mean, so, you know, sometimes we get too close to it in bowling, want to self-criticize yeah. and don't take a big picture look, you know, so. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. And I, the way that I would even say that is just, you know, there's nothing wrong with being aspirational towards trying to grow bowling more and take PBA or bowling to new heights, but also re remember to be grateful and have gratitude for where we are currently at, um, because there are so many sports and activities that would, you know, trade spots with us. Um, and, and my argument, which is kind of what we've already said, I think is when that person, when that parent says, you know, well, don't get your kid into bowling, there's no money in it or whatever, to your point, it's like, okay, well, the things that maybe at a professional level, right, where 20th makes more than what 20th makes on the PBA tour, will your kid better be to your point, six, four, six, five, six, you know, and if they're not, then one, one, even if they are, it's not a walk in the park to do that. But to your point, that's 1% of people, right? And if they aren't, why not introduce them to this thing that regardless of how they end up, you know, growing as an adult, they can do and perform at a high level. They can make a lot of friends while they do it. They can do it their entire life. You know, there's just so many. And, and I would argue that all of those other positives, you could argue, is, is the trade-off to PBA not being able to be the NFL. Right. Yeah. And that's ironic. And, it's kind of ironic. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and, and it could be, and please push back if you feel like that's an incorrect perspective. Well, but it I, can't, you know, I, I never give up hope that it can't be the NFL. I mean, I, right. I think that it, it's, you know, I, we, we know the real challenges there and you, you articulate them and, you know, but it's, uh, it's not impossible. You know, it's totally. not impossible. But. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I want to there's, that. You know, and there's sports where that give you sort of an inspiration at times, games or sports like poker or um, uh, where you say, well, wait a second. Now, this is taken off and this is played by – this isn't played by six foot nine athletes. I mean, right. you know, you, know you, you certainly have to be a, a certain level of, of ability and things like that. But, but it gives you a hope – and it's not – dangerous necessarily and there isn't collisions and so you say well this got popular on television and but it's not really popular anymore it didn't really have that kind of sustainability so most of the money being put into it is you know from the people themselves you know but and, and they do have the, those outside sponsorships and continue to continue to provide you know you know remarkable opportunities but uh um, but it hasn't like it didn't become the nfl <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was hot for a while is one of those things. And there's yeah. and you've seen trends and things like that start and stop. The biggest one I would say that is the more frustrating uh, comparison is golf. Yeah. And yeah. because they are they, they are. It is very similar to bowling. The game is very similar and in so many different ways. But in one major way and mostly in the same uh, in the area of demographics, it's it's still old. It's old. It's as older, older than us in terms of who's watching. But that demographic is um, and the people supporting it have a certain level of wealth or there's a certain level of, of uh, financial investment from key people and key right. groups that you're reaching. That's much different from bowling. And and once you're comparing and you're saying, well, bowling should just be on the same level as golf. Well, that would be like saying. You know, how many bowling centers in the United States have um, 300 members who pay $50,000 a year? <laughs> you know, yeah. how many you know, How many would pay, you know, $1,000 to, to bowl for one day yeah. at the center? Um, and, and so, you know, and it's, so it's not just the media differences or I, I hear people say, well, golf has 30,000 fans on the golf course. And so they have different revenue streams and things like that. Yeah, that, that's true. And that, and that is a, that is something that we, we can't necessarily do at this point, but that's not the real reason. The real reason is because of the support from a country club mindset, basically, 
yeah. uh, that, and there's like one country club bowling center in the country that I know of, you know, like the Detroit athletic club and the <laughs> people that are members there. And it's really cool when you're there. Uh, yeah. but, um, but it's, you know, so you're dealing with different clientele, different demographic. So you don't have the, the easy almost buy-in from people that are financially supporting it. Um, uh, and, and so it becomes an apples and oranges comparison. Totally. It's not yeah. To, yeah, it's just a complete death. Yeah, to, but I do believe me, I use it very often when I say, look, this this uh, Chris Barnes is as good at bowling as Phil Mickelson was at golf. And they're yeah. similar people almost in a lot of different ways. And they're and yeah. uh and 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 so and that and those comparisons exist up and down. And and I will always say that. All right, let's watch this uh, final, and now let's watch golf, uh, and um, let's watch this player have to perform in this setting, and now let's watch golf. And yeah. golf has its moments, and I covered golf, the PGA Tour for USA Today for five years. I was there every day, watched <laughs> Tiger Woods his entire, you know, his, the, the high cool. meat of his career. I was there at the ropes yeah. and talking to him after the round. Yeah. I, I like, I love golf. I like golf. I won't. I don't know. I don't love golf. I like golf. golf yeah. <laughs> and uh, but, you know, they they do not provide as much consistent excitement as bowling. Uh, yeah. And, you know, so it, it does become uh, frustrating you know, to hear yeah. those comparisons. And we yeah. do better than it in rate. You know, by the way, like live golf. Everybody's like, see, you got to do what lived golf did. I mean, they didn't do anything. They don't make any money. They make zero dollars. They were completely yeah. invested in by a group that sees the same level of wealth involvement right. and want to change their own perceptions by investing in it. Live Golf has been on against the PBA this year many times. I get all the ratings, and it has never come close to the PBA. The PBA ratings are higher every single time. And yeah. uh you know, maybe someday they continue to grow and get there, but it's not because they're doing really well. So other people invest in them. It, right. It's it's different, yeah, totally. different animal altogether. I want to be really respectful of your time. Oh, so. yeah, whenever, yeah, go ahead. I got, I have time, but yeah, don't, okay. don't worry. I know I'm talking on and on, but go no, ahead. No, no, no. You're totally fine. I just more brief. <laughs> I, yeah, I'll keep going, but I can't thank you enough for joining. So I just, I just want to be, be respectful of your time. Um, do we want to aim for like uh, in 30 minutes, 45 minutes or when, when, you know what? I, I actually am good till, yeah, I'm, I'm good till noon. Uh, and okay. so yeah, take, take your time. Okay, great, great. Okay. So I'll edit that part out and then we'll okay. get into this. So, um, so that's a great segue talking about live uh, and people talking about that, that gets into a question that I had, which is what is the most kind of common feedback that you get right now from bowlers about the PBA uh, that maybe might be a criticism that you think might just be from a lack of information or understanding from the consumer, you know, that you maybe wish more consumers knew or understood. So that way you didn't get that particular feedback or criticism as much. Like if they had this piece of information, they wouldn't say this particular thing or request this particular thing so much. Well, I mean, maybe I might have just stepped on myself there by talking about golf, but that is probably the biggest one is when people oh. when people try to create a uh, people try to say, we'll see if we only had done what the PGA Tour had done or if only if only bowling would be more like golf in this way. And then that would be the solution. I mean, that, that you know, that just goes to what I was just talking about. And and that's, um, you know, it's just completely not true and out of left field and just doesn't um, recognize the, uh, the, the, the audience potential and the clientele and the culture um, versus what we realistically, you know, currently and, and for many decades have had. And personally, I like better. I, I, I prefer, you know, a, a bowling culture versus uh, a country club type culture, but yeah, but you know, the money follows, you know, where the money is in, in a lot of times. So that's one of them. I think one that's more a little bit lower level um, that you hear a lot is uh, need more entries. You know, you gotta get more entries and entry fees and, and that would help the game. And I, I feel like people sometimes don't really do the math, you know, like uh, even in a, even in a expensive entry fee event, like the World Series of Bowling, like this year, 
thousand dollars to enter and you get we get a hundred and eight entries and it's full you know it's four on a pair and it's a 50 lane center and it's um and it's um solid competition where you're not just trying to rake as many people into it as possible um that's a hundred a little over a hundred thousand dollars in revenue the world series of bowling paid over a million dollars in revenue so there's nine hundred thousand dollars necessary necessary there if we were just doing a, a tournament based on entry fees the, the hundred thousand wouldn't go very far you know and when you know, when we do even the the, the smaller a uh, 64 um bowler event and it's five hundred dollars entry fee for the 64 players and that's what is that that's thirty five thousand dollars twenty five to thirty five thousand dollars you, you bring in an entry fee revenue um from a tournament like that and the the lowest overall purse we pay for events like that is one hundred eighty thousand. so yeah. you're talking about 130 150 thousand dollars that's added and so it, it kind of gives people some perspective that it's not the entry fees and we don't want it to be the entry fees right. that drives the sport now you know, poker, we were talking about a little bit earlier, and there is a little bit of that in poker yeah. where the entry fees drive it. And I've tried that a few times with bowling. I mean, I've tried everything, you know, and <laughs> not afraid to try anything. I remember trying some some uh, buy-in events, $5,000 entry events, and, um, and, and to think, well, maybe we drive this number up. And even though the number is going to be generated largely from the players involved, it will be really exciting, gripping to watch people bowl for that kind of money. And you know, we would get, I think the most entries I, I got in, in the in the years that we tried that was like eight. You know, it, it, it wasn't like there was going to be a lot of people going in for that. I think that in, in the culture of the PBA has always been, we're not bowling for each other's money. You know, we're bowling for, now on the regional level and on the senior tour level, it's closer to where you have to bowl for each other's money. And so we have to figure out creative ways to, to drive entry fees in, in those types of events. But when you're trying to reach an elite level and have high level um, prize money, um, it's not going to be driven by entry fees. Right, right. Yeah. Cool. So that's good. So to kind of recap for viewers, the two things that you probably get the most often are is comparing bowling to golf and the, the PB, more specifically the PBA to the PGA and understanding um, that there's something that goes hand in hand with that in terms of the, con the, the country club culture and the wealth and the orientation towards that as a sport, um, as opposed to accessibility, relatability, you know, those kinds of things, which is not country club culture at all. Um, and so just taking that into account when you're thinking about golf and only thinking about it through this positive light, as um, that, that sounds like that was kind of the, the main one is golf. When when there's comparisons, that usually yeah. is, that usually is the one. I mean, yeah. you know, that 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 kind of bugs you, you know, the most. Um, you know, right. And then the other was the other was just entry fees and understanding that the goal of the PBA isn't to generate uh, the prize fund and those kinds of things through the bowler, um, and 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 that. So that's good. That's good. Uh, now the other question I wanted to ask you next was the PBA. Speaking of revenues and, and generating money the pba league bowler certification program yeah why did the pba feel that it was something it should invest its time and resources into yeah that's a great one I, i'm glad you brought that up i mean and we were talking about bolero and, and what's new what's different um that pba lbc and pba junior um are things that we started since the bolero bought the pba and really could only uh, get them started because of Bolero and their right. initiative and ambition in those two areas. And, you know, well, junior is kind of separate. I mean, we, you can all see how important it is to have kids come up through the game, be connected yeah. to the PBA, you know, bowl competitively. It's, that's a place to tell people where to go. Uh, you can, you can, all, you can see why that would all be really good. The LBC yeah. that you specifically asked about, you know, well, you're, you know, there, you come at it from a few angles for one, there are, you know, when you're owned by the largest chain of bowling centers and they have 300 plus bowling centers and most of them have league bowlers and the number of league bowlers 
at Bolero centers is over 200,000 across the country. If you can bring them under an, umbre an umbrella of a brand that they respect and understand, the PBA, and, um, and be able to communicate to them, um, create better scoring situations for them, I mean, uh, statistical information for them to sure. keep them on the same page with where their scores are reported and where you can look them up. Um, you know, we still we still strive to create a, a great rewards program, which is getting closer and closer to being really spectacular um, right. for those people connected to the PBA and be able to communicate with them to watch the PBA and get involved with the PBA in different ways. Join the PBA um, and then and also create like a national tournament for people of all skill levels, the LBC national championships that we were that we pulled off and we're coming into our second year now yeah yeah um, all of those things not only create a great connectivity with bowlers that the pba should want and it drives our audience and it drives interest but it also creates revenue streams that bolero um to you know to their credit you know credits the pba with a percentage of the success in league bowling and that league championship uh, tournament towards the PBA bottom line. And right. generally speaking, the way that I always looked at it and the way we still look at um, how the PBA uh, disseminates it, its, its money and our profit loss um, is to take the full profitability or the full revenue of what the PBA generates and then what my, the thing that I want to grow more than anything is prize money. I mean, that's my number one. That's the sure. number one thing I want, want to increase prize money. So yeah. about 50% of the overall revenue would go towards prize money. And so if you can drive your overall revenues up, the prize money will go up. And that's if more great. people bowl leagues and more people invest in bowling in leagues and bowl in this national tournament that we're providing them, it creates a new revenue stream that we never had before with the PBA. And so okay. now that's why I want them to succeed because not only gets more people bowling, fills the bowling sure. center, all that stuff's great. Sells more bowling balls, helps our other sponsors. There's so many things that are great about it, but but the, the, the first one on the first line is more revenue, more prize money. Yeah, I think that's great. I don't think most people who, uh, you know, are interested in that conversation or that topic of, of the PBA league bowler certification program, even knew that I didn't even know that, uh, that, uh, you know, revenue from that is going to support the PBA and the prize funds there. Um, in your opinion, or when you were part of those conversations, what made, what ended up being the reason why they thought PB, the PBA league bowler certification was a better angle or approach than say the Bolero league bowler certification, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, to me that's uh, self-evident in the um, respect that the PBA brand has uh, has had oh, sure, sure. and what it represents. There was just there was and, no concern. Sure, you know. Yeah, there was no concern with like there being a confusion of like, well, do I need to be a PBA member to be a, B, a PBA league certified bowler? You know? Oh, yeah. Oh, there were plenty of conversations like that. Well, how do we delineate? How do we make sure people know this is still inviting to you? You can be any average. Right. You know, we're not going to put out difficult lane conditions. You know, you're not going to be pressured or have to score differently. Or you know, there were there. Yeah, for sure, we talked about all of those things and making sure it was clear this is under an umbrella of a respected sport uh, that has existed for so many years. Yeah. And so. Yeah, but you're right. I mean, there was definitely some concern for all of that. I mean, before we sold to Bolero, I mean, to me, you know, in in selling the PBA, you had to look at different growth initiatives so that prospective buyers would know we're not just buying exactly what exists. Here's the potential. And, right. and these were things that were always on my board uh, for 10 years for the potential of the PBA, a youth program, a little league right. for bowling that was connected to the PBA, a league bowling program, national championships for um, for people of all skill levels so they could relate a little bit better. I think you're going to see soon, I don't know if I'm breaking news here, but I think we're going to try to get a little bit more into back into that PBA experience type of oh, very cool. experiences for so people can, can, if they choose, bowl on um, 
on yeah. lane conditions that are closer to what you'd see on the PBA tour. So you get a better idea. You know, all those potential things really came into play because we have access to all these bowling centers. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that, that's great. And so I guess since it's always been on your list, even before the Bullmore purchase, how do you feel like the program's doing now um, based on your expectations going into it? Well, I was actually pretty blown away at the speed and the uh, willingness of people with Bolero to learn it, make it a priority, have a great group of people working on a, a set bunch of lists to launch it, you know, and now you're kind of, now you, you get to the point where now you're relying on people to follow through and become part of it and to learn it and enjoy it. And that will take some time. It's like this national championships tournament. I'm telling you, it's perfect. Did you bowl it last year? No, I did not. No, no. you should. I mean, I know you'd have to travel from Phoenix to Chicago, but yeah. Uh, if you travel for the USBC Open, which I assume you probably do, yes, yes, uh, and I love the I'm bowling the USBC Open June 19th and 20th, and and I you know I look forward to it every year. It's something I do, um, but the 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 dynamics of the PBA LBC National Championship are really incredible. I mean, the prize money and and the where the money goes is yeah. really attractive. The, the way that you can test the event as a singles competitor, but you can go with your teams and you can bowl team and doubles within a six games, the way you move uh, um, every game uh, to a different pair, just like the pros, um, that there's only four on a pair when you're bowling this tournament. Um, you know, the connection to the PBA, the chance of if you win your division, yeah, you yeah. will make it onto television. Oh, um, yeah, there's, cool. there's a ton of really yeah. exciting things about it. And last year we had a thousand entries. And I think that that's the ceiling there is just way higher. I, oh, I, sure. I believe we'll end up with about 2000 this year in Chicago. Okay. That's a good you trend. Know? And so it'll keep, and I think it'll keep doubling, but in a way that is literally doubling like one to two, two to four, four to eight, eight to 16. Suddenly we're real big with it. And, uh, and I'm, yeah, so I'm really proud nice. to have been on the, on the, uh, Here's how this could work. And here's how there's a lot of things that are unique and not the same as the, it's not just the USBC open or a state tournament. It's right. totally different, oh, yeah. but really inviting. And, and so, yeah. um, so I hope that becomes a big part of everybody's yearly schedule. Got to bowl that, got to bowl this, got to bowl this. You know? Yeah. It, yeah, totally. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's definitely on my radar. Cause I, I've kind of moved into this different, you know, period of my bowling life where it's a lot more social and relational, you know? Um, and so anytime I have a, an excuse to go travel with some friends and go bowl something, it's just finding the people that, you know, I'll, I'll want to go travel and do it with, but I'm sure I will probably be a, a customer of that event at, at some point. Um, but the PBA league bowler certification program leads into a kind of a, another question I think other people would have viewers would have, which is, you know, you have this rewards program. You even have equipment and specs now as well. Um, which, why should or shouldn't consumers view the PBA as starting to appear as a competitor or a different option to the USBC? Well, I could see why they would look at it that way. But, you know, if you knew the, the level of cooperation that did exist and, um, you know, we have different levels of competition. So equipment specs, you know, is different for us at different levels, perhaps than the USBC for their league bowlers. And okay. while for our league bowlers, we would be very similar to USBC and work lockstep and, and really, you know, even encourage people to be USBC members too. Um, you know, I, I think that, uh, I think that they would realize it's not like a battle. It's more like, how do we, um, how do we grow the game and utilize the unique strengths that each, each organization has to, to grow the game? Um, you know, so not to, not to say there ha hasn't been a lot of tough conversations and a lot of different yeah. directions taken on the PBA sure. tour and, and have it relate back to equipment specs. And, um, and, uh, but I think all ultimately all, all transparent and all up front and working with bowling ball companies and working with, players and working with regular bowlers the usbc to make sure we have the right answers and not just create nothing but confusion or sure. um, or difficulty to getting involved with the game um but having uh, having our own rules and being able to to uh to deal internally f with with the lbc league bowlers 
um, is a is a strength of, of the organization and gives a lot. And there are a lot of people that were members of leagues in Bolero centers and in the future in any centers that weren't members of the USBC. And now we're giving them a membership into a uh, into an organization that hopefully creates a connectivity with them so they'll never quit the game. Um, so I think both the USBC and Bolero and, and PBA, you know, understand our, our roles, our general roles and want each other to succeed. Got it. So d- with the LBC program, as well as the actual championships, the event, is there, was there an aspect of that decision that you felt like was servicing an area of bowling that currently USBC wasn't able to service? Or do you feel like USBC is service? I mean, cause you guys focused on awards a little bit, right? At the beginning, which mm-hmm. USBC didn't do. Um, mm-hmm. Is most of that, do you feel like most of the products and offerings there is just an area that the USBC is currently missing? Uh, didn't come at it from that angle, though. Not, okay. not coming at it like, well, the USBC stopped awards. We're going to give awards. It was more like, no, we have an organization. How can we re- give people rewards? It's just like any, you know, just like any kind of. And I think that the, uh, that the idea that you're that at least initially uh, the people that were members of the LBC were all customers of one chain, you know, does create some marketing advantages over a more loosely related um, partnership with bowling centers uh, that the USBC has. And, and even that a strike 10 has, and, um, in the in the opportunity to utilize bowling centers as a marketing, so it, which is great, and which they do, and and um, we support them and and rely on them in so many different ways. But then also there's an opportunity to communicate directly um, in stores that are all on the same page, right, um, right. or should be, and yeah. and so that that it just gives you another layer or level of uh, connectivity. Uh, and cu- uh, culture and community, really, that yeah. um, that could be a little stronger. So, yeah. you know, so you hope to maximize that. Yeah. So tell me if this is fair to say, because, you know, obviously there, especially online, there's a pretty, generally speaking, more of a negative sentiment to USBC than a positive one. So it sounds like to me, maybe what, what I could, this video can give to viewers is that Bullmore and the PBA were really going about it more through the lens of how do we add more value to our current customers, you know, and it's more through uh, trying to add value from an organizational lens. Uh, so it's much more positive, progress oriented perspective. It wasn't necessarily them looking at the USBC and saying they're doing some type of negative or bad job over here. Somebody needs to pick up the slack. And then go, coming at it from that angle, right? Is is that fair to say? Is that making sense? Yeah, yeah. And I don't ever think it was it would have been pointed at one organization. I think yeah, maybe, it was more of just it, it, it could be a general observation that bowling could do a better job in general of organizing everyone together, have the right direction and and communication to each one and it'll take a long time to perfect that it's not going to be perfect sure but uh but yeah no but at the same time you know when i talked about the indiana event that i just went to i sat with jason overstreet from usbc who was their deputy executive director and and listened to his his presentation about all the growth areas that usbc has uh, has succeeded in and their financial stability and uh, particularly in youth and collegiate and, and, and those same groups that we talked about earlier as needing to grow. And, um, and so I love to hear any, all that success. We want to hear that. It, it, yeah. yeah. It's not like you're sitting here watching a, a battle play out. I, I can understand why people would think that I can, I can understand yeah. that, you know, in some areas, maybe both sides maybe do feel a little bit like that, but I don't think that would in any way be yeah. a bad thing. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm, I'm a little bit of that type of person who tries to bring people together and, and mitigate conflict. And so that's why I was trying to ask. And, and it's really hard to boil it down to a one or two sentence thing. But I mainly wanted to pull out that it really wasn't an antagonist approach. It sounds to me then like what you're saying is the most of it is oriented towards how do we add more value to the Bullmore experience, right? Because the the LBC program is a Bullmore it's for Bullmore League bowlers, right? For the mm-hmm. most part, is that yeah. correct? 
Yeah, um, well, and, and the tournament, though, is open to yes. all bowlers. You so, don't have to just be a Bolero bowler. You know, right. get a little so, discount or a chance to enter early, little things like that, but open to everybody. You know, yeah. That's so, what PBA is, of course. Right, right. So it was oriented, you know, the, the most of it is oriented towards adding more value to its customer base, adding more services and layers to the relationship that Bullmore has with its bowlers and, and value and those kinds of things. But then there was a secondary aspect of also saying that maybe bowling as a whole could do a better job in these particular areas. Um, and that was kind of the driving force, not necessarily this antagonistic um, view that maybe some people might think between the PBA and USBC. And I just want to Take yeah, the opportunity yeah, and creating more more revenue for the PBA, as we talked yeah. about before, too. Yeah. You know, so, so you can not only utilize that brand, but help that brand. And now when you have a little more control of it, you're not just going to another organization and asking right. for more investment. You're you're starting your own that will enable you to potentially uh, generate more revenue uh, from that aspect that will help the overall company and, and professional yeah. bowl. Yeah, now well, speaking of... That's too. Help with Fox too to be able to say, look, we have, yeah. you know, we have this connection. We have these stores with big screens in every one of them, and we can help make sure that Fox is on. You know, Fox Sports is on. Uh, PBA is on TV in these in these places. We got to get better and better at that. But those types of things, you know, um, have nothing to do with an antagonistic or Yes. relationship with somebody else. It has to do with doing, doing the, the right things in the best yes. way you can. Yes. Yeah. And and I, that's even another way of saying kind of what I kind of felt to begin is really successful organizations or organizations that are growing like the PBA is, they they don't ever do it from this like comparison. Anti, you know, it's always they have their own goals. They're hyper focused on those goals. They're trying to be really creative on, on, on how to accomplish those goals. You know, and, and that's really where it comes from. Right. Um, but I don't want to spend too much too much on that topic. But I did want to kind of touch on it because I think it is on a lot of people's minds, you know. Sure. Um, and, I, and I can't emphasize enough, in my opinion, the nuance is lost a lot of the times, you know, how the PBA came up and decided on this product is important just because it looks like it may be a competition to USBC doesn't mean that that was their intent, you know, and I, I think the nuance is important there. Um, but, but getting to USBC, you were the chief marketing officer in 2005. Um, what made that not enough for you and made you go to the PBA? And also, do you feel like the USBC is any different now than it is than it was back then, for, for better or for worse, positive or negative? Yeah, well, I was there 2005 to 2008. So I was there for three years, and, and, I, was, and I actually was uh, in charge of their strategic planning um the last year i was there and we put together what i felt like was a uh well i loved the, the strategic plan <laughs> that year because i i was you know kind of tackling it you know but uh, and it really was to in a simple way grow bowling as a sport and get more people to when asked is bowling a sport to say yes and and so you know you do studies and find out how many people and what's the percentage and then you have a goal and it's to get to this percentage now how are we going to do that and a lot of it was to support the PBA and make the PBA bigger and i loved working with the PBA nice. and believe in PBA being strong we even started a women's series and the women's series for cuz the the PWBA was defunct at the time. We brought that back. We brought back a PBA women's series to work with the PBA and get more women on TV bowling to help that uh, imagery. Um, we also created television shows on different networks that brought together USBC champions. Um, the Clash of Champions was awesome event. And um, and we did that in 2008, I think was the was that one the first one they continued yeah, yeah. one more year after i left but then they stopped it after i left but uh yeah. they uh but that that was an initiative and then we just got so involved in um, promoting the ideas of coaching and college yeah. bowling and so we just really wanted to i wanted to focus on these really high impact sport elements get on television we created bowl tv back then i remember creating yeah. bowl tv back in 2006 or something like that right. and um and all of these things were uh, were built to uh, to improve our media standing. I also would would go out and get news stories done about 
bowlers and and try to utilize public relations as a way to change those perceptions all back to the same things we're fighting today yeah and uh you know so we did all of all of uh, those things and then in 2008 the the usbc kind of changed its focus for a minute because it, they were going they were going to go through a huge undertaking which was move from milwaukee to Texas, Texas and be in the same building with the bowling proprietors. And so they had a different kind of focus and strategic plan from what we were doing. And, um, and that strategic plan I was doing was built so much in relation with the PBA that when those changes were occurring, the PBA, Fred Schreier was the commissioner and CEO at the time um, with the Microsoft guys, they, they contacted me and said, you know, the things you're doing, would you should do for the PBA. And, and so, you know, let's, let's transition. We'll, we'll talk to the USBC. We'll make sure they're okay. Well, you know, it was a, it was an effort, a collaborative effort and said, okay, this guy and his focus and what he's doing, we believe in, but we think it would work better with the PBA. So that's why I I moved. Um, And since then with the USBC, they've had ups and downs, you know, but, um, when I see their their recent um, convention and and see yeah. their recent reports, I mean they're in a really good place, I think, and yeah. uh, they have the lot. They have potential to do really strong things, you know, in, in the game. And we have partnerships with the USBC on the U.S. Open, on the USBC Masters, on Bull TV. Um, you know, all of our PBA 50 tours on Bull TV, all of our early round coverage of the PBA is on Bull TV. Um, PBA Junior is on Bull TV. Uh, a lot of our regionals. Uh, so we've, you know, ended up combining forces uh, with that product and uh, and working together on major championships. And so, um, you know, I, I th- you know, generally speaking, all of these things have, are working very well. You know, mm-hmm. the, the where where you where you get stalled is the expectation, possibly, yeah. or the yeah. desire for it to be much bigger than it is. Right. without really recognizing maybe it's really where it's supposed to be and maybe it's fantastic accomplishment to be where we are as opposed yeah. to not working towards those things and working together so yeah. yeah it's a it's a great study and for sure because somebody else could say well if you just would have done this you'd all be millionaires you know yeah maybe i you know i don't know i feel like we tried just about everything yeah <laughs> and, and we all and and you know and we are doing relatively, you know, well as an industry. And, and yeah, I've, I've, uh, it's funny. I, I have it on my list of kind of something I really want to do, but to do it thoroughly would be a big undertaking of trying to create a piece of content, like a, you know, a YouTube video that's really engaging. And I feel like it's, if we can grow our channel bigger, it'd be something I want to do when it's bigger. So it can have more reach that really lays out how successful, uh, where bowling's at, you know, really relative to these other sports, like you mentioned, but then also just the sustainability uh, aspect, the durability aspect of bowling of, you know, how long it's been around and, you know, going back to when, you know, professional bowlers made more than professional baseball players and understanding that like, you know, we didn't completely die and, and really paint that picture. But to me, you'd have to have a lot of stats, research information, and then lay it out in a really compelling way not only the USBC numbers, but the PBA numbers and even the recreational, the amount of people bowling. And um, cause that's one of the things for me that, I mean, that's all I know. I don't have a college degree. You know, I started working in a pro shop and it's, it's literally all I know. And as I try to, you know, talk to people and better inform myself, I'm like, bowling is so much more than what people give it credit for, you know? Um, and that, that leads a little bit into my next question, which is, you talked about strategic planning for the USBC. Um, and when uh, the your, the whole year thing, thing came out with Purple Hammer and the differing rules and the USBC had its research and its, its decision, to me on social media anyways, you saw a much more positive reputation. To me, it seems like the PBA has a much more positive brand and reputation. And that specific scenario really illustrated that uh, than the USBC. From a strategic point of view, as someone who, again, that's kind of the background with USBC, what do you think 
the USB-C is maybe could, could do better or is potentially missing? Or what is the cause as to why the USB-C seems to have so much more of a negative reputation or what it appears to me as a negative reputation compared to the PVA? Because I get that they're governance, but the PVA is kind of governance to a degree as well, right? You, you guys have to have your own rules that you have to enforce to a degree with your players and your members. Um, but it doesn't seem like those players or members, generally speaking, have as negative of a view that we can see online of the PBA as those same people, how they view the USB-C. Does that question make sense? That's a little bit of a ramble. but Yeah, but it, it's, it, it is. There are different audiences. There's different. I mean, the, the million people that are members of the USB-C, if you took a vote from them and, and, and said, um, you know, well, we want to donate X amount of your money towards uh, professional bowling because if uh, there's a great inspirational model and people are, are famous and uh, making so much money bowling that more families will get into bowling and more kids will stick with it uh, and take it up and make a lot of sense with that, you could maybe have a vote of those million and lose by a ton. You might, you know, you might be surprised sure. because because it's just a wider audience of people that have different reasons for being involved with, with the game. And the USBC has to govern all of them as opposed to the PBA, uh, you know, uh, separate from the league bowlers that we just try to organize, but on the right. PBA, on the professional level, having a, a real laser focus on winning and competition uh, as being the, the number one, the, the number one and two things about uh, being a PBA member is just to compete sure. with people on the highest level of the game. And, and so you have different audiences. So it becomes difficult yeah. to have these arguments with people because they don't see that uh, as much, you know, and in, in our case with the urethane issue. And I mean, it was just, it became too obvious and, and too published really that there was a difference or uh, something happening to certain bowling balls that were bringing it under underneath uh, the the level that was acceptable uh, by rule and it was impacting the game at the highest level so that something you know had to be done or you know you were just going to live with a constant um nagging issue yeah a nagging issue uh, attitudes and opinions that were you know contrary to the health of a sport so yeah. we had to act on that and it wasn't easy to do and it wasn't easy right. to break from the USBC in certain areas uh, but really for for the most part we we used a lot of their findings and their in their observations as evidence as to why we needed to do something so sure. yeah sure. It, it's uh it is a tricky issue but um yeah I and mean, that was one of the more tricky ones that I've had to go through. And it took years, you know, it yeah. took years of trying think, to get to the bottom of it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a good point to help people understand and realize the difference in the PBA versus the USBC in terms of who they, at least at this moment, who they most focus on. You know, like you're saying, PBA is much of the higher end competitive player, at the, you know, and USBC is everyone. Um, but what I'm curious of is because you have been so successful at moving and pivoting the PBA and keeping a very positive reputation, very positive brand of the PBA, as well as yourself, right? Like multiple owners you've worked under, you've made, so you, you clearly have this strategic ability outside of the PBA to really navigate brand and reputation, right? At least from my point of view. Mm -hmm. I'm curious of, do you think the USBC should be doing more or less of anything to navigate that brand and reputational aspects that it seems like they're facing right now. So completely separate of you as the PBA, just your strategic mind. Do you yeah. feel like it's just unfair? It's unwarranted and that, you know what I mean? Does the question make sense? And we can yeah, skip. You no, know, I, I think, you know, if I, ha you know, you, you, you're kind of, you know, making me sort of say, you know, what, what area should they do, be better at or fix? Or you something. can say it's unwarranted. You can say it's unwarranted or well, that you, you know, think that they're I, doing a pretty good job. Can. Any group, any group can do better in certain areas. And, and even the PBA can do the area that I'm thinking that comes right to mind to me is, is more of a communication and more of a, um, to a wider audience and uh, utilizing um, funding to reach more people. And, and it's not like they aren't, I mean, and, and in conjunction with strike 10 and go bowling, um, they are support, they are, they get 
like the Macy's Day Parade, you know, or or NASCAR races. They're trying to bring other people in to get them to go bowling, and then they understand once they are bowling, here's how you have to hit them to get them to stay in bowling, and um, and and I think all those things are are in place. Um, the frustrating, I think, thing for a lot of people with USBC probably, and it was for me when I was there, and, and for even the PBA is is the uh, the culture of uh, of complaining from the bowlers themselves mm. can sometimes overwhelm the fun of some people. And, and yeah. sometimes you, you, you go, okay, but if they have a good point, you know, we need to address those issues. And sometimes you feel like you do address them and you do take care of the big problems, but then new ones crop up that maybe aren't as priority and you believe that wait maybe we're just waiting to complain about things here you know yeah. and, and so oh, that's and, and I, it's it happens in other sports it happens with other fan bases it happens with sure. you know uh, but you have to uh acknowledge your own weaknesses and that could be a, a weakness I, I think the reason why generally speaking my my personal you know uh, brand or the idea that people that there is a certain level of trust and believe me i take a ton of of hate too but, but i do have a certain rapport with bowlers because i think they feel like it's there's a sincere love of the game there's sincere efforts to move forward in areas that will help them help the game help the prize money uh, whether it's wildly successful or not they know that we're trying to do the right thing and have been for a long time and continue to provide great entertainment, you know, for them um, across different platforms. And I think it's uh, generally appreciated, you know, but you got to have results too, you know, so, yeah, totally. you know, but, but the USBC is underrated in that, yes. you know, how many other sports have that size of a membership yeah, yeah. and have to deal with membership in that way and have to deal with it through independent, um, bowling centers as your true hosts. So you have yeah. to build relationships with that entire proprietor or association. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's not easy. That, and that's why they decided at, at that point 20 years ago to yeah. combine yeah. forces right. and, and be able to communicate more. So I, I really do feel like everybody is kind of working together and in the right directions. Um, so what is that? What are we trying to reach? You know, what do you want? You got to go. What are so you're there's a there's a sort of level of frustration that you're trying to get at. What's stopping us? OK, what's stopping us from what? Being yeah. on national television? We're on. Yeah. So sport, we're on having a national. Look at the USBC Open, having a having a national championship event that lasts for six months, that 50,000 people travel <laughs> to that city. Yeah, competing. Exactly. I mean, that's awesome. I mean, that's an awesome event. And and so what, you want that to be better, I'm sure. I mean, you know, so at what point yeah. do you say, what are we What are we complaining about? That yeah. my score isn't high enough or the scores sure. are too high? You know, so, that this person shouldn't be better than me. And so that right. clouds my judgment on everything in the game. Sometimes you see that type of thing happen. Yeah. Yeah. This sport, I, I'll let you tell me in a second. <laughs> but no, this sport, okay, you know, ahead, Social media should be the greatest tool for us because we should all realize we're in the same boat. We love bowling. We understand the strengths of it. We need to spread those out. We need mm -hmm. to get more people under the tent so that they can enjoy it. And then it makes it better for all of us. And social media is basically free. And we have this new way to advertise that we never had before. And yet you see it used really a lot to just, yeah. Throw thrones and be mad 100%. and say this is bad yes. and this is bad yeah. and we don't like this and and so it'd be nice to be able to get those people and i think that all comes back down to communication and how yeah. do everybody you know yeah it's just that uh, no totally so to kind of sh share where i was coming at with the question um i view usbc very positively as someone who's been on local boards and really try to inform myself of everything that it does and how it does it and you know, I've ran tournaments locally. And uh, so for me, what is interesting is the difference between what USBC is really doing for bowling and accomplishing versus its brand and reputation. That mm -hmm. to me is the interesting topic. So I don't have a personal narrative that 
is like that USB-C is negative or this bad thing. And I want Tom Clark to validate my narrative that USB-C is bad. I have a personal narrative of, of USB-C is doing a lot of good. Why are they perceived so negatively? And yeah. so there's just a more of a curiosity there. And I see a guy that has been so great at navigating brand and reputation. And that's where kind of the question came, came from, but I'm hoping to do this with, with Chad Murphy as well. And, and kind of get to the bottom of that as well. Cause from listening to many interviews with him, I think a lot of times I hear, well, we're governance. And so people aren't going to like governance. And I, I just think it, it, the answer has got to be more nuanced than that, but I don't want to spend too much time on it with you, but yeah, well, you know it, that. It, you know, it, it's been through a lot of changes. You know, one thing to uh, can consider that is a little bit outside the box, but we talked about how bowling is a lifetime sport in some ways that, that, that can hurt a, a perception <laughs> Yeah, because you, because the people that stay in it get older and older and older. We love them. They're fantastic. They're my friends. I'm I'm one of them. I mean, I'm 55. I mean, you know, and, right. and my dad bowls. He's almost he's almost 80. He still bowls twice a week and loves the game. I mean, that's what he does. He bowls and, you know, and. But those people, you know, kind of are on this side are, are, are to a point where what they do is say it was better before. And what they do is they say well, this changed and it ruined it. Oh, you know, as opposed to kids who are coming up, who we need to hit, who only frame of reference is the World Series of Bowling. Right. You know, right. Their only frame of reference is, uh, wow, Belmo. He's awesome. There's, But there's so many other people who just say, oh, Belmo, he ruined the game. Yeah. Because, yeah. Uh, because the two-hand bowling is different. Synthetic yeah, lanes yeah. are different. Automatic yeah. scoring is different. When you bowl in league and how much it costs and what a beer co- – all of these things are different, and they're all the same people. So they end up sort of – well, what about this? What about this? And also we're comparing to a sport that prior to the entertainment boom in America across all kinds of platforms and different ways to spend your, your entertainment dollars, bowling was like number one. There were 10 million league bowlers. The ratings on TV were 10 million minimum watching every week. And now right. you're at a million league bowlers and you're at, you know, a million, hopefully people watching on TV. And so you, you see from 1975 or 1980 to 2024, a decline. So there has to be blame for that sure. as opposed to just a societal shift and the, the negative, um, uh, feedback that you have to get from people who aren't even new into the game you know so it's uh it's it's a well shit the book uh bowling alone was fame was it yeah. was a great book and it's kind of you know along the lines of what of what i'm talking about and yeah, yeah. Uh, you know we have, think, it's, it's different you know? yeah i think you mentioned a, a good point there that was really probably something i was trying to pull out of that for people which is that a great aspect about bowling is that you can do it for a very long time and but on the flip side to that, we know that as you get older, it's it's harder to to take in change. Right. I'm pretty sure, you know, you guys can roast me in the comments if that's not not the case. But I think science and research suggests that as, as we get older, it's a little bit more difficult to be adaptable and change. And so then as the sport is declining and trying to change this, this great aspect of it that allows people to do it at a, forever can also kind of flip on itself. And now those same people are seeing it change and decline and they have a hard time necessarily maybe adapting to those changes. And maybe not all the changes are great, but again, you can kind of see this interesting theme that I, I think that we're really coming to with some of the answers to these questions of how some of the very positive aspects about bowling, like being able to do it your entire life does have trade-offs and everything has trade-offs, right? I mean, when you run a business, the, the size that you have, you probably know better than anyone. Everything has trade-offs. Um, and so I, I think that's a, I think that's an interesting perspective. Um, I got a couple more. I'll try to get here to you uh, before we run out of time. So um, the first one, I think that most people would want to know, I'm going to actually skip ahead here just in case we run out of time. Um, you have been working with Bullmore now for a while, and this is another, you know, has mixed reviews. We'll say nicely. Um, and I live in a Bullmore, pretty, pretty Bullmore heavy area in Arizona. What do you think consumers get most wrong about Bullmore in terms of, of as a company that like something? Yeah. What do you think they get most wrong about it? 
you know, I, it, it's not even something I really think about. Uh, but I think, um, I think probably just the idea that they don't really care about the sport of bowling. You know, okay. and it's hard to say that about an organization that owns the ultimate level of competitive bowling, the PBA, uh, or that has started a PBA junior with competitive, or that hosts so many tournaments on every weekend all around the country and opens its doors that way to them. Um, you know, I, I think that's probably the biggest uh, misconception that, that I can think of. They, they they certainly haven't progressed in how they've continued to, to buy centers and, and go public um, um, by ignoring the uh, the sports side of the game. They even, even creating a league bowler yeah. community. Um, you know, that, that shows more of a dedication to the regular bowler and the league bowler uh, than I think that they're given credit for. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And um, that's why I wanted to kind of touch on that. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but, you know, I just know that there's some people out there that maybe if we can reach them and, and, you know, influence them even a little bit, I think is good. Um, my last question is, where do you feel the, in terms of positively impacting bowling as a sport, where do you feel like the PBA reaches its limit? And uh, in terms of, you know, you need help from the USBC or the BPAA, is it mainly the lower average players? Like, do you feel like PBA, the PBA's wheelhouse is the, the higher average player and it reaches its limits to positively impact bowling with maybe getting people from recreation to competitive or yeah. What, what do you feel like the PBA reaches its limit in really trying to positively impact bowling? Uh, I probably have to look outside bowlers necessarily and, okay. and want to bring in sports fans. Okay. I, th I think that that's the area where we need more people watching completely as a fan uh, and following the action uh, and understanding what's going on. And I think that the biggest change in society and the biggest change in, in bowling even in the last uh, couple of years has been the acceptance of sports wagering and gambling on sports, betting on sports. And when you see like betrivers.com really dive into bowling and, and have great numbers and odds and things you can bet on all the time, uh, with the PBA is a great sign because I think that that might help a more general sports fan get into it and realize that wagering on bowling is fun uh, and uh, is is very exciting and it kind of you know I've always said that watching a family member bowl is like the most excitement you can have watching anyone play a sport because you're watching someone who's it's all up to them. They're, it, they're yeah. by themselves and they, and they have to perform continually. And, and you feel so much pressure because the person seems like they should know they should be able to complete a task, but it's never easy and things can happen and bad luck can happen and good luck can happen <laughs> and you live and die and you basically end up crying in, in, in and the emotion and the drama when you care who wins, you know? Right, and right. so that's the biggest task is for us to make people care who wins. And the fastest way to get people to care who wins is if they're betting on betting it. Betting on it. Yeah, it's, sure. Now they want that team. They want the exactly. bowler to win or the PBA elite league. They want the team to win. And if they, if they're invested to that level, they're going to love it because wow, it's exciting every single time. You can't, predict, yeah. it's unpredictable. Yeah. It's hard. So, I feel like that's an area where we can reach that general sports fan where I feel like we're a little bit capped now. Sure. No, I think that's a, I think that's a great answer. I know I have a lot of friends who will only watch games because they're betting on it of, of other sports. So yeah. Tom, uh, we're getting to our time. I can't thank you enough, man. It's a uh, really great talking to you again. We have 4,000 followers. So the fact that you have someone like yourself who just, you know, answers my email and says, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll do that. You know, and, and, to prepare for this, I've, I've seen you do many other uh, very small channels and stuff like that. It is, again, another amazing aspect about bowling of how easy it is to talk to EJ Tackett or how easy it is to get Tom Clark on your channel. I can't thank you enough. And thanks for everything that you've contributed to bowling over the years as well. I, I really appreciate it. 
Hey, thanks. Thanks to you. Thanks. Thanks for you for having the initiative and uh, to, to start up a, a channel like this and uh, have really intelligent conversation about a sport we love. I mean, the reason I do it, the reason EJ does it is because we love it and uh, we want it. We want more people to get into it. We want more people to love it the way that we do. Yeah. And we know that you're starting with a group that can help spread that word. If all those people that you have following you and watching you can help tell other people or their friends, hey, you should get into bowling. You should get into a bowling league. And they have this. They have this. Oh, you could win this money. Well, you could, or you could watch bowling and bet on it. And you can get involved with it this way. And it's on TV. It's on this weekend. You should watch. Kyle Troop is going to bowl. This guy's really cool. You know, he he identifies with a lot of people. People recognize him. Yeah. And now all of a sudden they, they're pulled in and I feel like they'll stick with us. And ultimately, if we're all trying to make as much money as we can, if we're all trying to get the players as much money as we can, if we're looking for the biggest success that we can have, I think that success on television in ratings is probably number one because media yeah. rights drives professional sports. Yep. When we talk about the U.S., I'm sorry, I'm going to keep going on. I'm sorry. No, no. USBC, you know, it compare the USBC to the USGA. And the USBC has more members, and they do more. And But the yep. USGA invests and, and basically concentrates its finances and, and recognizes all of its financial wealth from the U.S. Open. And the U.S. Open being a valuable media commodity so that a network will pay the USGA to have the U.S. Open on its air. And when they're paying them that as much as they have to pay them, and we're talking numbers that don't even compare to bowling. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're getting into the billion number before. Yeah. You, uh, when, when you have that kind of support from a sponsor who's going to recognize the right kind of audiences on TV and benefit from it, if you can bring that to bowling, you, it's limitless in what you can do. And that's why when I was at the USBC, I centered on that and thought, this is where we can, we'll make the USBC Masters the biggest tournament there ever was. Yeah. And now with the PBA, I want every every major championship. And I want to work with the USBC. And I want, I want our ratings to be so high that when Fox has to re-up with us, they have to pay more. Or yeah. you have the right and you have the ability to negotiate and find another partner who would find value in you. And these people are not... They're not just fooled. They, they don't, they don't <laughs> listen to one person who says, yeah, this would be great. There's numbers. They're working off facts. They're working yeah. off data. And so we have these great opportunities right now when we're on Fox to have gigantic audiences watching thrilling competition. And if that happens, all, all of the little problems will all be, they'll be bigger. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you want. You want all your problems to be even bigger, but yeah, everybody's making more and more people as part of it. So yeah, that's so funny. Yeah, and and uh, yeah, I mean, there's. I think it's been proven. You know, there's nobody that I think bowling would rather have in the position of trying to accomplish that goal than you. And I feel for whoever someday in the future has to uh, fill your shoes. It's going to be very big shoes to fill. Uh, <laughs> but Tom, thanks, thanks so much, man. I, I really appreciate you joining us. Thank you, Craig. Thank you. We hope you found this video useful. As always, if you like videos like this, make sure you hit subscribe. And as always, thanks for watching.